On the evening of the assassination, Louis Feldsot, who was the owner of Crescent Firearms, who imported Manischer Kokona rifles into the United States, reported to FBI agents that Crescent sold an Italian rifle serial number C2766 to Klein Sporting Goods on June 18, 1962. On July 23, 1964, Feldsot provided an affidavit to the Warren Commission. Feldsot's affidavit conflicts with all the records related to the arrival, the reworking, and their subsequent sale to retail outlets such as Klein Sporting Goods. Importers of rifles, such as Crescent, were required by law to maintain a list of the serial numbers of rifles they imported into the United States. The retail purchaser, Kleins, was also required to keep a list of the serial numbers of each gun they purchased and resold to a retail customer. The track of an individual firearm from importation by Crescent to retail store, Kleins, and to a retail customer, in this case A. Heidel, was a simple matter of tracking serial numbers. The problem occurred for the FBI that Crescent sold C2766 to Kleins on June 18, 1962. The records that we currently have allegedly obtained by the FBI, showed that C-276 was still in storage and not delivered it to Kleins until February of 1963. By the time the FBI gives these documents to the Warren Commission, there's no carton numbers and there's no serial numbers of rifles. The absence of carton numbers prevented anyone from tracking C-2766. In January 1962, Kleins placed orders with Crescent Firearms for 36-inch model Manager Kirkconnell rifles which they advertised and sold from February 1962 to March 1963. When Heidel ordered an Italian rifle from Kleins using a coupon from the February 1963 issue of American Rifleman, he should have received a 36-inch rifle. Kleins only had 36-inch rifles from March 62 to March 63. That's all they had. So how did this guy get a 41-inch rifle? On the evening of the assassination, the FBI agents went to Klein's and looked at microfilm records from something like 10 o'clock in the evening to 5 o'clock in the morning. And from that microfilm, they allegedly printed Oswald's order document for the Manischer Carcano rifle. The microfilm was never returned to Klein's. The microfilm is not in the National Archives. And all we have are photographs of alleged documents that were printed, allegedly, from Klein's microfilm. In reality, without the original microfilm, we have no idea what we've got. I don't think the rifle was purchased ever from Kleins, and the lack of documentation supports that conclusion. We can go on and talk about how Oswald received the rifle. There's no indication that he ever received a rifle. There's no written verification, no anything. There's not one person who said they saw Oswald carry a rifle, handle a rifle, purchase ammunition, purchase the clip, nothing. Transporting a rifle from Dallas to New Orleans, back from New Orleans to Dallas, nothing. The Warren Commission story is that Oswald buys this money order at the post office, mails the letter and goes back to work all in a half an hour. The problem was the front of the envelope that was allegedly mailed to Kleins, which the FBI provided to the Warren Commission, shows that it was mailed from a postal zone several miles from where Oswald's office was. Oswald would have to have purchased a money order, somehow gone to a mailbox several miles away for whatever reason, and returned to work within a very short time, half an hour. The last airplane that had meal service that day left at 12.30 in the afternoon from Love Field. And it arrived in Chicago, 2.33 o'clock. The money order was written, mailed, and winds up at Klein's the following day, one day. Robert Wilmoth was the Vice President of Operations at the First National Bank of Chicago. He explained how a money order was routed after it was endorsed. The first endorsement, of course, being by Klein's, paid to the order of Klein's. Wilma said that when a money order was presented for deposit at a bank, the bank teller would stamp and date the money order with a First National Bank of Chicago endorsement. This would be the second endorsement. It would then be sent to the Federal Reserve Bank in Chicago where it would receive their endorsement and a date stamp. Finally, it would be sent to the Federal Postal Money Order Center in Kansas City where it would again be stamped with a fourth endorsement stamp. According to Wilma, this money order should have had four separate endorsement stamps. But a quick glance at the postal money order shows that it was not stamped by the First National Bank of Chicago, Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, Federal Postal Money Order in Kansas City. This money order was simply never deposited into any bank or financial institution. Who in Dallas, Texas would have access to postal money orders following the assassination? There was a man that provided the FBI and the Secret Service with information following the assassination 
that nobody else knew, who allegedly looked at a stub of a postal money order, and the only one that looked at the stub of the postal money order and had the number of the postal money order, and he called the people in Washington, D.C. to try and find it. That was Harry Holmes, U.S. Postal Inspector in Dallas, Texas. Holmes said he found this money order stub, but he never produced it. No one ever produced it. If you were an employee of the United States Post Office and you found the stub that was allegedly used to purchase the rifle that killed the president, wouldn't that be a valuable document? Interestingly enough, Harry Holmes never discussed postal regulations involving rifles when he was interviewed by the Warren Commission. Certain documents had to be filled out. Holmes never mentioned anything about that. And he's a postal inspector. The postal money order that Harry Holmes allegedly found a stub for, that information was relayed to a Donald Dugan, who instructed Postal Finance Officer J. Harold Marks to initiate a search for the money order in Washington, D.C. There's no logical reason that money order should be in Washington, D.C. It should be in Kansas City, Missouri, where Oswald's other money orders were found. These five money orders, and they're published in the Warren Volumes, that Oswald bought at the same post office the postal money order was allegedly found at the Federal Records Center in Alexandria, Virginia, by Robert Jackson, an employee of the National Archives. Everything about this case is in the details. Why is a postal money order at the Federal Records Center instead of in Kansas City, Missouri, where it should have been? What in the world is an employee of the National Archives doing locating this money order? The easiest way to show people that the rifle was never ordered or never purchased by Oswald is simply to look in the Warren volumes at that money order. Once you see that it has never been cashed at a bank, then you simply have to ask yourself, how in the world could this rifle have been ordered? Mailed to a post office box, signed or not signed, federal regulations regarding firearms, all those things are secondary. If you don't have a cashed money order, you don't have a purchase in the first place.